I, I uh, had done uh, much traveling in India, uh, working with missionaries there, and I saw many uh, orphans. There are over 35 million orphans in India, and the need was so obvious that I decided that I would like to do something, and the idea uh, generated in my mind that I would like to build a home for orphans, and I didn't know exactly how to do that. So I looked all over India, literally, uh, to find someone uh, who was uh, responsible in India and, and uh, could work with me. And if we raised money, that he would be responsible and that he would use the money well and that he would be honest and keep a good accounting of the money. And I found such a man back in 2004. Actually, in 2003, I found him. In 2004, uh, I went over uh, uh, with, we had a committee uh, that met and decided on buying land and hiring staff and hiring other people, such as architects and, uh, and con construction managers and uh, we got advice from people who operated orphanages in India. So we formulated the whole plan and uh, put it all together in 2004 and were able to buy land and uh, hire all the necessary staff. And so in February of 2005, we opened the orphanage uh, with 60 children, space for 60 children, uh, since then, we have expanded uh, that building, which has now become the boys' dormitory, added another multi-purpose building, which also includes the girls' dormitory, the dining hall, the kitchen, and infirmary, so that we have two large buildings and three smaller buildings, and we house 155 children. The orphanage is located in the town of Chirachanpur, which is in the state of Manipur, and that is way up in the northeastern section of India. It's actually east of Bangladesh. It's between Bangladesh and Myanmar, formerly Burma. If you look at a map of India, you can see Calcutta is right next to Bangladesh. Manipur is beyond uh, to the east of Calcutta. It's a relatively primitive area of India. It's in the foothills of the Himalayas, so it's hilly. It's not flat so that it doesn't lend itself well to rice paddies like most of India does. Uh, they, uh, because it's uh, hilly, it's also very beautiful. It's a very pretty part of the world. Uh, and uh, it's right on the edge of what you might call jungle. It's very dense forest into the mountains and on into the east into what was formerly Burma. The James Connection is actually a corporation formed in Pennsylvania. It is qualified under the Internal Revenue Code as a 501c3 charity. We also formed the James Connection Trust in India under the India Trust Act, and it's uh, the charity in India. And the James Connection Trust actually is the owner of the land where the orphanage is located, and we call the orphanage Angel's Place. Uh, each year we're growing. For instance, right now, we're trying to expand even further. We have a fund drive that we've just started for to raise $150,000 to add two floors to our, our multi-purpose building, which will give us a lot more needed space for things such as studies, indoor recreation, uh, meeting space, that sort of thing. We're, we're quite crowded now uh, uh, for meeting space. We have a lot of people that come in on Sundays. We have a worship service on Sundays there, and we have well over 200 people that will sh show up for a worship service, and our meeting space is quite cramped, so we need that. We also need space for where the children can study uh, right now. And their study uh, space is somewhat limited, and quite often they have to sit on their beds uh, to study. Also, that part of the world has monsoons, heavy rains, which is very necessary for uh, cultivation. But 
during the monsoon season, the children can't get outside, so they need indoor recreation area, and so we, uh, our expansion will include that. The impact of uh, Angel's Place is, uh, is in some cases quite profound. Every one of these children has a terrible story. Every one of them came to us because of some tragedy in their family. They uh, don't have parents. They don't have adult supervision. Orphanages are uh, perhaps not quite as desirable as finding foster homes. And when I first started to work on this, I thought maybe I would work on numerous foster homes rather than orphanages. But there are so many orphans in India that you can't find foster parents, enough foster parents for them. You have to put them into larger organizations, into larger uh, congregations of children. So orphanages function well in India. Now, uh, even though they are not as adequate, say, as having a, a home in which you have two parents or a home in which you have two foster parents, orphanages in India are almost like emergency wards at, at hospitals. Um, the children that come to us in many cases are in danger for their very lives. Uh, we've had two children die from AIDS. Uh, we've had another one die from leukemia. <clears throat> we just took in, for instance, this year, uh, 12 uh, girls, because we had space in our girls' dormitory to, to uh, house them. And they, uh, when they come in, you'd be impressed by how emaciated they are and how undernourished uh, they are and how unhealthy they are. You'd also be amazed that within six months, how much they improve when they have a diet that has some protein in it and a diet which uh, gives them uh, enough uh, food so that they can actually grow. Uh, you'd be amazed that uh, within a few months how their complexions brighten, their energy level uh, is up, They're, they start acting like what children ought to act like with the energy that they, they should have. Plus the fact that when they come to us, many of them have missed school. In India, even in the public schools, you have to pay for things such as books, pencils, tablets, that sort of thing. And many of these children cannot even afford that. So when they come to us, they may have missed uh, one or two or three years of school. So uh, when you get them to a point where they're healthy and they have enough energy, they become better students. We send them to a private school. We don't send them to public schools uh, so that uh, in the private school they can catch up. And quite often the kids, once they, once they have enough to eat and they have the time to study, uh, they can not only catch up but perhaps skip a grade so that they get back to their normal grade. There's a great deal to tell. I think that uh, to me what is important to see is now we've been, uh, had children in our care since 2005, eight years, and to see what the children came from and to see how they've progressed in eight years is really quite amazing. Uh, and not only that, but these children are not exactly like American children. They realize the terrible circumstances from which they came. And they also realized that if they had not come to Angel's Place, that they wouldn't have had the opportunity to, uh, to uh, get an education and to learn how to get along in life. We've had now three children have graduated from Angel's Place. That is, they have stayed with us long enough to graduate from the equivalent of high school. And they've all three gone on to college. Now we realize that all of our children are not going to go on to college. We now have seven of our children who are coming along behind them that have all qualified under state examinations to take college preparatory courses and they are doing that in what is called a, a, a college. It's more like say a community college would be in Pittsburgh. But uh, uh, these children now have the opportunity to not only get healthy, 
but have the opportunity to become educated and have the opportunity to uh, learn life skills uh, so that they'll be able to make their way once they become adults. Well, there is a Pittsburgh connection uh, with this, and the Pittsburgh connection is that I live in Pittsburgh. And my church, uh, uh, I became uh, very excited and committed to this project, and my church has uh, provided a lot of support and a lot of personnel to the committee. And uh, uh, we have branched out to other churches of uh, many denominations throughout Pittsburgh. And we've uh, now had contributions from every conceivable source around Pittsburgh, and now our fundraising has expanded to all the way to the West Coast and all the way to Florida and the South. I just finished uh, making some speeches in Tennessee uh, next week, I'll be speaking at a, at a church in West Virginia. Uh, the preacher here at our church uh, in Holiday Park is uh, now uh, on a, a trip to raise money in Georgia. So uh, our, our, uh, ex we've started in Pittsburgh, and we're expanding from there. Well, I can, I can rally people that I know. So I, I know people in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a lawyer, I'm not a fundraiser, so this is all new to me. I've, I've never operated an orphanage and I've never been a fundraiser. But my wife is a, uh, a, a very experienced fundraiser. She raised millions of dollars for the Pittsburgh Symphony and millions of dollars for the Pittsburgh Public Theater and for other charities in the Pittsburgh area. And she gave me some very good advice when we started out and that say, she said that uh, People give to people, and if you know people, then those are the people that uh, will give to you. And if they, if they have confidence in you and your project, then these are, these are the people that are going to support your project.